The skill set of content and social matters a lot more than if you're a travel blogger. There's a million travel bloggers that don't get any views. Attention is the number one asset. I wanted to ask you, for a lot of Americans, they're moving overseas and they are becoming digital nomads. So I wanted to know if you didn't want to become necessarily a travel blogger, what's a good platform to use and what's a good strategy if you're an entrepreneur and business owner but don't necessarily want to, you know, do traveling? So so you're saying you don't want to travel? No, I'm going to travel, but I don't want to document it like that. I want to educate people, but I'll be in different locations. So would they be more interested in the different locations or are they interested in what I'm teaching? Well, well, a bigger question is what would you like to teach? Like, what are you trying to accomplish, right? Because I love that you're thinking about them, which is exactly right. But ironically, the best way in the world to be selfless is to be selfish. Meaning, for me, for example, why I'm even on this stage right now and why you know me is I think the world lacks perspective on how much good there is and how much opportunity there is and how much is going well. We are fixated on what's not going well. So I have a passion to talk about those things and I had a passion to talk about entrepreneurship and wine and lots of stuff, many of things that weren't really popular when I first started talking about them. And so I can give you a lot about what the audience is gonna want, but first I wanna make sure I understand what you want. What would you want to do What with the content? What are you trying to accomplish? I would love to educate them in dope environments. That's what I would like to do. Educate them on the things that I've been learning throughout the years, firearms training, or personal defense and how they can protect themselves wherever they go around the world, but making sure I do that in a peaceful place for me and my mental health. I love that. So the key here is it doesn't matter where you are to do that. I built one of the largest wine shows in the world from New Jersey. (laughs) And when I did it in 2006, like everybody was like, well, you gotta do this in Napa. You have to move to Napa. And I'm like, why? So, you know, are, are people intrigued by the visualization of where people are? Yes. But it sounds like you're trying to teach people something that's important to many people. And the setting or the backdrop is not very, very, very important to that. It's a component, but you can do that anywhere and anywhere. And I think the question becomes, do you actually know how to do it? Ironically, this is a fake cover, but I announced this today. So I'm launching this next year, right? And it's heavy detail on what I'm gonna tell you right now, which is it doesn't matter if you're in Sri Lanka, Japan, or Manhattan, if you wanna reach people, you need to make sure you know what time to post, what the first three seconds of the video look like, what the thumbnail looks like, how LinkedIn works different than YouTube. You have to understand the distribution and the content that works in it. And then more importantly, the slang, the the wording, the copywriting, the skill set of content and social matters a lot more than if you're a travel blogger. There's a million travel bloggers that don't get any views. 10 million travel bloggers that don't get any views. How well do you know your content of all the things you've learned, self-defense, all this firearm training? And then how good are you at the craft of putting out the videos, the pictures, and the written words on these 10 social media platforms that dictate society? No, oh, that's great. Um, next question. Gary, grateful to have a little time with you. I'm Christine. Thank you. I'm known as the yoga boss, and my intention is to inspire and empower people with yoga meditation. And I've used NFTs to help give people access to meditation. And I feel like, especially in the last year, the criticism of and skepticism around NFTs has created a huge marketing challenge. So I'm curious how your vision of how creators can utilize NFTs as vehicles for consumer engagement and customer retention has evolved over the last year. Just patience, you're absolutely right. No different than in 2001 when all the internet stocks crashed and everybody had a bad taste about the internet and all the articles were written that the internet was a fad. All I was doing at winelibrary.com was just building. I was just building the website better. I was getting my email newsletter better. I was making the store better. Same with BeFriends. As the NFT thing had a over excitement and then recorrection crash. I've been working on the physical stuff, squish pillows, trading cards, pins, and refining our Web3 products and services, building and preparing for the next wave. And so to your point, you know, I'm not in the business of convincing, I'm in the business of conviction. 
So my conviction for the blockchain and for Web3 and for where NFTs are gonna be in society hasn't changed. In the hype of NFT land, and it sounds like this might've hit your radar, I was making videos that 99% of NFTs were gonna go to zero because NFTs are a platform, not individual projects. Mm -hmm. So you're right, right now, the overall consensus on NFTs because people are headline readers is the same way people treat everything. They don't fully know and they're just kind of like looking at it and there was over speculation. 99% of sports cards are not worth money. Michael Jordan's rookie card is. 99% of contemporary art is not worth money but Rasheed Johnson's art is. 99% of sneakers that people wear are not collectible sneakers but there's sneaker con and there's all sorts of Jordans and Air Force Ones that are rare and sell. So people got caught up last year, two years ago, thinking everything that was an NFT was worth money. No, it's a digital collectible or in your world, it's a digital asset or marketing tool to get people to make it a utility, a membership. There's a lot of things that NFTs are gonna be used for. In the meantime, to your point, you can't lead with NFTs right now because it's not that time. Mm -hmm. You need to be building your skill set and be prepared for when it is that time again, whether that's six months, a year, two years from now. Ironically, NFTs from a collectible and trading standpoint have had their best week this week in the last 18 months or 12 months. So, you know, you never know when it's going to happen. But I think for you right now, I'd focus more on content and social networks while being behind the scenes, educating yourself on all the advancements of Ethereum and new NFT protocols and keep practicing and then be ready to hit hard when it's back, just like 2005, six, seven internet was that post 2001. Hey guy, I want to jump in really quick. I want to just ask a question. How do you stay abreast? Of, you, you know, you're always right on the, on the edge of, of culture where things are going and then you, you know, start leading it. How do you, and what's your strategy? When you learn something, you just jump in, but what do you, how do you, keep abreast of it, and then how do you make those decisions to say, I'm going to do? It's a great question. Um, I put in the work. Like, I'm gonna fly, to, I got Vegas F1, right? A lot of business development this weekend coming up. I have a five hour flight at 8.30 in the morning on Friday. From, from 8.30 to 11.30 on that five hour flight, I'll get my work done, my email, this, that. The last two hours, I'll do all sorts of random curious stuff that's happening in the world. For example, if you can see, I'm wearing a corduroy hat, right? Uh -huh. As you know, because you're hip, you know, uh, <laughs> people are rocking corduroy hats. I'm actually curious why. Mm. Like, just like in the late 90s, early 2000s, corduroy hit pants. Right now, corduroy hats, corduroy jackets, they're hitting again. I like to know why. Like, and then I'll go into ChatGPT or Google or social media and actually spend an hour trying to figure out who popped it off? Did Michael B. Jordan rock it at Paris Fashion Week and that got it going? Is there some TikToker nobody's ever heard of, but she's the next fashionista? Was it pushed by a brand that really wanted it to pop off and they had the juice at the moment to get it done? I always wanna know why things are happening. What Netflix show is working? What food trend is happening? What part of the world is popping off? Like why, 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 why? Everything is curiosity, everything is why, but here's the thing, Marty. Even at my state of where I am in my career, where my time is now really valuable, mm -hmm. I still think that I out curious most people. Mm -hmm. You know, and so for me, I saw Ice Spice happening six months before people really felt it, because I'm in the trenches. I'm looking at social, I'm looking at Google Trends, I'm just listening. You know, it's funny, I'm such a talker. You know this actually. You and I had this night in Can talking about a pretty important subject you know, around race and life. Mm -hmm. and you got to see a version of me that most people don't get to see. We sat on a boat, you and I, for three, four hours. Yeah. And I only talked once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was not only because I was being respectful to the subject matter, it's because I listen way more than I talk. Y'all mm -hmm. see me when I talk. 90% of my day is behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so I think the reason I've always been on it is I'm not sure how many people are outworking me in paying attention to culture. Mm -hmm. Culture, the way we now talk about it, which is like, let's call it what it is, black urban culture, which is the cool. But then, you know, Midwest culture, hunting and fishing, country music, Latin trap, food trends, diet trends. Why is stoicism 
increasing. Why are people walking barefoot in grass for grounding? Psychedelics, Japan, anime, video games, Fortnite recall. Like, I'm in it. <laughs> you know, I, I, and, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I don't know if you, you saw when, it, when, when I was on the boat, I, I, I had a manga comic I had created and the artist had actually created it. And, and, and similarly, I think that curiosity is one of the strongest tools that we don't like. I read Japan, I read Chinese and Korean fiction every night, and I've been reading it for a while now. Curiosity is probably going to be the thing that allows us to really solve some of the wicked problems just by just a hundred percent. A hundred percent. And and my, it's my entertainment when people watch Netflix or you know, obviously I love my sports teams, so they get precedent when they're playing, but for me, it's like fun. You know, think about all the people that love curling up to a book for two hours before they go to bed or watching the same movie or watching a Netflix show or drinking wine or going out at night clubbing. Like it is my great joy to sit for two, three hours of curious culture digging a night. And I just think I'm outworking the world on that. And I also think I'm naturally talented at making the next leap, which is some people could read and see a lot of trends around cupcakes but I have a knack for understanding what does that mean and what's gonna happen next. Mm -hmm. Hey, my name is Charles Minifield, and um, you've had your company, uh, well, one of your companies, your media company since 09. And yes, sir. I wonder what would you do if you were starting that from scratch today? How would you approach it if you were building your media company uh, right yep. now? Yes, sir. I would do the same exact thing I did in 09. First, I would keep costs down. I started the company in a conference room of another company, so I had no cost because I didn't have money. I believe when you start a company, you need to start from the dirt. When com you know, everyone talks about, I need to raise capital, I need to raise capital. I always get scared because I think like, you know, like, you know when we were kids, if you were the kind of kid that got like five bucks and then you bought some shit in the store real quick and your grandma would be like, man, that money's burning a hole in your pocket. You know those people? I feel like that's what a lot of founders do when they raise capital, they spend it on dumb shit. So the first thing I would do is keep it humble. And the second thing I would do is what I did with this media company, which is sell things you know. What I knew in 2009 was social media in a world that most people didn't know. If you're asking this question for yourself, you gotta ask yourself, what do you know? People start companies around where they think money is versus starting companies around things they like or things they know. The only companies, that I get excited about as an investor is if I feel the founder really knows it or really loves it. And you show me somebody who really knows it and loves it, and I'll show you something I'm really interested in. So I think that keep it humble and keep it slow. People want it fast and then do something that you really know or you really love. I really think that framework puts you in the best position to have a successful company and then be patient because it takes time. Hi, Gary. My name is Jose Marquez. Uh, I'm the, the chairman and CEO of, of Tech Latino. Uh, you've heard of us. Yeah. Uh, and then Ivan Peña has been uh, one of our members that has been in the, who lives in New York and ran yep. our chapter for a while. He's a good friend of yours, and I wanted to say hello first of all. Awesome, Jose. Thank you, brother. Second of all, I want to say thank you for introducing me to yard sales. <laughs> <laughs> Because let me tell you, I've become a yard sales warrior. And because of your advice, um, I found a very, very prosperous uh, card of Roberto Clemente's rookie card. Unbelievable. You know, and that was right there in, in the box. And people didn't even, they didn't even know it was there. Amazing. I want to say thank you for that because that was a $21,000 windfall that I made for two grand. For two thousand two dollars, I'm sorry. Two dollars. Twenty-one thousand for two dollar investment. I know, brother. It's there. I keep trying. Listen, I make I make those garage sale yard sale videos because so many people email me and say, Gary, you're talking about investing in Facebook. I got forty eight dollars. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start making content for people who have forty eight dollars because <laughs> And I know exactly what I did and I know what's going on out there. I believe that most Americans are lucky enough to be in a place where they could go garage selling or thrift store shopping or Goodwill store shopping 
and spend $30 and make $300, $400 every week. And that really matters for a lot of people, a lot of families. And obviously you're talking about a very incredible find, but for a lot of people, the emails I get, like somebody emailed me actually yesterday, I think they're going to Disney World, they're paycheck to paycheck family, but the entire family for Christmas is going to Disney World proper too, like nice hotel, good flight, and all of the money happened in the last five months, making $7,000, buying $1 items on at garage sales and selling them for 30, 40 bucks on eBay, Poshmark, Facebook Marketplace. It's there for people that wanna go get it. And it's fun if you like it. So here's my business question. I've been doing Tech Latino now for 27 years. Wow. We have brought the Hispanic community from point A to point from nothing but not even knowing what Cisco was to over indexing on cell phones and getting that uh, broadband experience that they needed and they couldn't. What do we do next as an organization to help our community? I mean, look, I think there's a lot of ways to think about that. I think similar to the first question, it's what do you feel that is most needed? I believe education is massive. And then the next part is the putting people on. So for example, Maybe we can do a business development deal where people that want to either enter marketing technology or switch careers and get into it. I'm a unique entrepreneur where if someone is in Join Tech Latino and they, you know, they're a lawyer, but they don't want to be. They want to be in like digital marketing. I'm not the kind of guy who's scared to hire someone like that just because it's not on their resume. So I think what's next is going from education to becoming a place that puts people on and start business developing with things that creates opportunity. So I'm Isabel Molloy, and one of the hats I wear is as a professor at Georgia State University, and this is where we're calling you from. So Amazing. Yes, it's coming, right? I, you've been very transparent about how you feel about higher ed in very colorful language. So yes. I challenge you, and I love that. And so, but assume for a moment that we are working with a population that is in college and committed to continuing. So they've already made that decision. At our best, we're a community of practice with a captive audience that's willing to learn. So how do we leverage that time at the higher ed experience and our resources to help them develop their entrepreneurial skills, which is literally something that transcends discipline and that will be perhaps more useful long term than the actual craft that they're using in, in a moment? I love it. Couple things. One, on the subject matter of higher ed, I actually am dramatically more, as you can imagine, when, when in context or clipped in a certain way, it seems that there's a certain point of view I have on higher ed, but just so, because I respect it so much, I want you to hear this. You know, obviously I'm 40, I actually turned 48 today, is my birthday. When I grew up, every single kid in junior high and high school was told that if you do not go to college, you are a monumental failure in society. So a lot of the content I started creating 20 years ago was like, look, college is not for everyone. I'm one of those people. But boy, do I think college and higher ed and advanced even, you know, the highest levels of ed is exactly right for a lot of people. I genuinely believe that. My big passion is trying to make sure that people are self-aware. To your point, what I love about your question is, look, I believe where higher ed struggles for people that are looking to be in entrepreneurship is similar to the concept of reading about how to exercise versus exercising. And so what do I think you can do in this captive audience? We have to go to the field and do. Entrepreneur classes from your incredible institution to Babson to USC to all these places I've come and spoke, they must require these kids or people that are transitioning into new chapters in their life, they must require them to do. It's very, very hard to get good at swimming without swimming. It's very hard to get good at cooking by watching unlimited content about cooking and reading cooking books. Must cook. And if we're going to advance their entrepreneurship, y'all need to create programs where the entire semester is actually being an entrepreneur. Thank you. Love it. Uh, one more, Gary. Hi, hi Gary. Happy birthday. Thanks for being Thanks. here. Catherine Johnson. I'm an executive with Storage, Distributed Cloud Storage, and Share of Storage Institute. Um, my question for you is what um, excites you most about the future of technology and what scares you most about it? Great question. Um, what scares me is that people are scared of it. 
we're, we're incredibly good at demonizing technology. What excites me is it's the undefeated advancement of the human race. Everything we are today is based on people innovating in technology. 80% of us were on farms 150 years ago until we started inventing the tractor. So what, I, what I'm excited about is it's why the world continues to get better. We, we, we sit and listen, there are unlimited problems. Humans are flawed, but, but we continue to get better and better and better, even though it doesn't feel like that in social and traditional media. So technology is why our life expectancies and all these things, there's so much good about technology. What I fear about it is we're gonna over demonize it because it's getting more powerful. And what I mean by that is, of course I understand what AI means. It means it may commoditize something that is special. My entire life is based on my brain power. If, I, if everyone takes every video of me and everything I've ever put on the internet and put it into an AI learning bot, my special sauce gets commoditized. I'm not confused. I also know that I can adjust. I believe in the human spirit. And so I'm concerned that we continue to demonize technology to a point where we start to suppress it and manipulate it into something that doesn't have the potential to bring as much value. Ironically, it's similar to the last question. My issue with education is the way that we package and sell it, mm. not the concept of education. There's nothing I believe in more than education. My most emotional, exciting answer in this entire interview was me staying up at night educating and trying to be educated. So, you know, I think, I think our relationship with technology is, you know this, we all know this. 15 years ago, all the tech stuff was clapped for and amazing and doing these positive things. Now it feels like it's all bad. AI is gonna ruin the world. And I'm, I'm not naive, but boy, am I practically optimistic and so, I, you know, when, when, when parents are like these kids, they're on their phone and they're constantly on their phone, I look at them and say, so be a parent, mm. right? Like succumbing to like, we, like, like, what ha like all of us in this call, like we were parented. If my mom didn't want me watching TV, I wasn't watching TV. We need to focus on modern parenting issues, not on technology issues. I know that's right.